Hey everyone, this is Charles here from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 160, we're going to take a look at two very interesting Soviet tubes. But first, caution everyone. Electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them, and always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Okay, so one of the common themes you'll see with our kit amplifiers is that we tend to choose tubes that mostly aren't being used by other builders. Sometimes the reason the tube isn't being used is because it has a different filament voltage, like the 12SN7 tubes we looked at last week. But one of the most common reasons why you'll see a tube not being used is because it's not one of the handful of tubes still being made in a modern form. So I can't really blame some manufacturers for avoiding them. They might be unsure that, you know, 10 years down the line, will I be able to get these tubes for my amplifier or am I, am I going to have to change the design? Or are my customers going to be able to get the tube for the amplifier? It's a legitimate concern. It's a real shame though, because there's some really interesting stuff out there that is still available as new old stock in large quantities. And that's going to bring us to the two tubes that we're going to look at today. The GU50 Power Pentode and the 6N6P Dual Triode. Both of these tubes were made in huge quantities in the former Soviet Union, so they are still available today at reasonable prices as new old stock. Let's take a closer look and I'll go over why we decided to use them. All right, we're gonna start with the GU50. And don't let the looks throw you. This tube is a beast. Well, I mean, it looks like a beast, but it's a beast in terms of audio quality too. And it's got some really interesting history. The GU50 actually started its life as a Telefunken design called the LS50. It was used by the German armed forces in radios during World War II. And just like all the other Allied powers, the Soviets captured a lot of German technology and specialists when they took the country. Now, I wasn't able to find in my research whether they simply captured and reverse engineered these tubes, or if they were able to get factory tooling and manufacturing expertise. But I strongly suspect it was the latter, especially since the majority of Telefunken production facilities ended up in East Germany initially under Soviet control. And that includes the Funkwerk Afut, I hope I pronounced that better, factory that Telefunken had set up before the war to increase their tube production. And the Soviets weren't the only ones that uh, ended up copying this tube. Switzerland, West Germany, Czechoslovakia, and China each have their own copy or a derivative of the tube itself. So it was originally used in radios during wartime, but after the war, it began seeing usage in TV sets. And because of the large quantities of new old stock that were available, it started seeing popularity with hi-fi hobbyists, mainly in Europe. So much so that there's still new production versions of the unique socket that was being made just for this tube. I think I've got one here. Let me pull that out. There's one of these beautiful ceramic sockets for these tubes. And it's designed to be panel mounted and and um, point to point wired, sorry. I thought somebody was just coming up our driveway there. <laughs> okay, where was I? Ah, yes, okay, so we can still get the sockets for them, which is really neat, even though it's such a strange tube. And even though it uses a weird socket and it looks pretty weird, it's gotta sound pretty good, right? And my answer to that is absolutely. When we were first looking at it, we kept finding references to people calling this the poor man's 300B. We even had a customer recently tell us that the sound of it reminds him of a single-ended 300B amplifier that he had heard. And those kinds of comments aren't far off from reality, at least performance-wise. Oddly enough, even though this is a, a indirectly heated power pentode, it actually has very similar operating characteristics to a 300B when you try out strap it. And the 300B, of course, is a directly heated single triode, and that just means that the cathode and the heaters are one component inside of it. That increases the complexity of the design for it. So having it indirectly heated is actually an improvement and it makes it easier to build. So whenever you were running 
this tube, pure class A, we can actually get over eight watts per tube. And that's without insanely high plate voltages, ridiculous heater currents, or any other um, weird design considerations for that you sometimes have to make whenever you're working with a weird tube. And we're not even running, running class AB. I mean, it's just class A, eight watts. That's pretty good. It's a very efficient tube. If it does have one flaw, it's that the construction is all glass. I mean, this metal cap here is not connected to it in any way other than just being crimped around the edge. You can actually see it moving a little bit here. So being all glass, it means that the socket pins protrude through the glass just like the smaller all glass nine pin tubes. So if you insert this tube into the socket the wrong way, maybe you put it in on an angle or these pins don't line up with the receivers on the socket itself, what's going to happen is these pins are gonna bend. And if they bend, they're gonna break the glass. Even though the designers put this huge, thick chunk of glass down here for these to go through to stabilize them, you're gonna break it. Thankfully though, a little bit of care a little bit of patience and you'll get these mounted just fine and you know we haven't killed any of them in our amplifiers yet and we're running them constantly here so these tubes are going to be very very long lived and you won't have to replace them very often okay so that's our power tube what about our driver tube ah the 6n6p it's a tube that we're also using as a driver and preamp stage in our second prototype headphone amp. And that, and it's one tube that's quickly becoming my favorite tube ever. Where did the 6N6P come from? Well, when Soviet production moved to a smaller, uh, to a smaller nine pin standard, they could have done what the West did and created a direct nine pin equivalent of their octal tubes. They did have the 6N8S, which was a 6SN7 equivalent. So of course they would have probably wanted something that was equivalent to that, but smaller. In the West, we had tubes that were like the 6CG7, 6GU7, 12AU7, 12BH7, E80CC, which are all nine pin medium mu general purpose dual triodes. But the Soviets had other ideas and you see them doing this with a lot of their different designs. They took the concept of a general purpose dual triode to a whole new level because the 6N6P can do it all and it's just one tube. Do you need a medium amplification factor like a 6SN7? It's got it. Need a high current capability like a 6N7G to drive a power stage? It's got it. What about low output impedance like a 6AS7 to be useful as a cathode follower or in an OTL output transformerless setup? Well, what do you know? It's got that too. You could use this tube as a regulator in a power supply, as a preamp tube for an amplifier, as a driver tube for a big power tube, and as a power tube or as a power output tube itself. It's extremely versatile and it was made in absolutely staggering numbers in the former Soviet Union, with all but the earliest ones having a design that didn't change for close to 40 years. I actually have two different tubes here that were made, let's see here, this one is dated 1995, this one is an early photon production, and this one is dated 1966. Let me see if I can get these better in focus here. Sorry, the lighting isn't the best here right now. But as you can see, they are essentially identical tubes. There is a small variation between the two that you can tell them apart with. But this is one thing that we absolutely love about Soviet production tubes. Whenever they found something that worked, they stuck with it. So none of this would matter again if these tubes didn't sound great, just like with the GU50. You can have a listen to yourself in our previous episode on the headphone amp prototype. I'll put a link below, probably in the comments, but I'll share a few quick words about it here. It's clean, warm, detailed, and has some of the best low bass reproduction that I've ever heard. When we swept the prototype of the headphone amp, we hit the output transformer's low end frequency limit all the way down around 20 hertz. And you can really hear the difference that that makes. All right, 
So why am I talking about these tubes again? We've surely said that said most of this before, probably in other episodes, talking about the G50 and the headphone amp. And I've almost positive I gushed about how much I love these on camera. At least once. Well, Black Friday is coming up, and so is our yearly Black Friday sale. And on the last day of that sale, we're going to be doing our first ever promotion of our kit amps. We don't normally include tubes when you buy our amplifiers. We like to give people the choice of where to source their own tubes. And we don't want to be like all the other guys who send out their amps with a set of budget tubes that you want to replace right away. But for this one day, we're going to send out both our Universal 6 or 12 SN7 kit preamps and our GU50 kit monoblocks with some great sounding vintage tubes. These aren't budget tubes. They aren't used tubes. They are high quality, great sounding, new old stock. The kind that we run in our own amplifiers every single day. So if you want to take advantage of this deal, be ready for the end of Black Friday. For returning customers, we're going to send out an email blast to let you all know. And for everyone watching, we'll remind you as soon as, as sorry, we'll remind you as we're getting closer. <laughs> okay, so what came in? Well, we've of course had a ton of stuff coming in. We've been stocking up in preparation for the sale. And frankly, there's just too much to show. So I decided to focus in on one type. And what we have here, let's see if I can get this all on screen. Oh, maybe I can. Maybe I have to zoom out just a little bit. And what we have here are three different 6080 tubes. Now the 6080 is, well, was originally used as a power regulator tube. Um, much like I talked about how the, the 6N6P can be used earlier, these were used in regulated power supplies to supply as much current as the circuit needed without causing a voltage drop. But they found a new life as a output tube, mostly in OTL amps, output transformless amps, that direct couple to a, uh, to a pair of headphones. Um, a good example of that is the Bottlehead Crack Amp, which has seen huge popularity over the years. So we try to stock these whenever we can, and we found some absolutely amazing ones here. So I'm going to start off with these two guys. Um, well, first of all, let's take a look. Look at these huge boxes. Like, I don't know if you can tell the scale of this on camera here, but they are massive. These are beyond the size of a normal power tube box. And quite nice. So we have an RCA 6 AS7GA box. And we have a Sylvania. Sorry about the focusing. And that is a 6080WC box. And that's these two tubes right here. And you might notice they look pretty darn similar. And I think it's likely that this RCA, oh, let me get that in focus, that this RCA tube is actually a Sylvania that's been rebranded. And that's really not that uncommon. It's made even more likely whenever you realize that the RCA says it's a 6AS7GA. And the 6AS7 was never made in this sort of bottle format. This is whenever the 6080 came out. This is the format for it. So both of these look quite similar. The bases look quite similar. There are a few minor differences, but I think they're within the realm of the different versions that Sylvania made. But these are rock solid tubes. They're great testing tubes. Um, we just found a small number of these new old stock and they're gonna be in the store right away. Uh, these ones actually we haven't been able to test yet. There's just too much going on. But I believe we have some of them still listed in stock. I'll check that after I put this video up, actually. And, uh, and I'll get these tested and in the store as soon as possible. But this is how they came in. I mean, you don't get much better than this for new old stock tubes. So those are fantastic. And we managed to find something that we've never gotten our hands on before for a 6080. I'm sure you all spotted the Toshiba box here. Look at that. Now, for whatever reason, the Japanese 
6080 and 6 AS7 tubes are very uncommon over here. You see a lot of tubes, um, like the small 9 pins, getting imported. Maybe it's because they were li lighter weight and easier to import. But you don't see a lot of the bigger tubes. And we managed to find a small number, I think we have 8 of them, in the store of these Toshiba 6080 tubes. And look at the beautiful text on the base. Some of them have text on the base like this. Other ones have it on the glass. And I didn't realize this before, but I pointed it out whenever we were testing them. Tokyo, uh, sorry, Tokyo, <laughs> Tokyo Shibara. So I'm assuming that's where Toshiba, the name, comes from. So I just thought that was interesting. And these are really nice looking tubes. They follow the standard 6080 build format. But being that it's made by Toshiba, I'm sure it's probably going to sound different from just about everything else out there. So we've got a bunch of them in the store. They tested absolutely beautifully. Very high current, close match sections. Uh, I'm sure anybody out there with a crack amp is going to absolutely love these. Okay. Now, if you stay till the end, I've got the usual discount codes for you. We have flat rate shipping of $20 around the world. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping is on us, folks. Stay safe, everyone. Have fun. This is Charles, signing off. Cheers, everyone.